and a half percent generally across these markets. Let's talk about the speed with which we are watching this market deteriorate. We're red everywhere essentially, down by four, five percent. We're down over 16 percent. Dow at the same time has fallen about 18 percent. The stock market is now down 21 percent. Because we're now down 43 percent. What in the world is happening on Wall Street? Two-year no yields went from 190 to 166 in the blink of an eye. The stock market crash of 2008 was the biggest economic disaster since the Great Depression. Wall Street, the place that had always been idolized because of how it signified capitalism, disintegrated. The big investment firms that had run Wall Street in the American economy for decades, such as Lehman Brothers and J.P. Morgan, were destroyed. As we sit here in 2017, nine years after the worst economic disaster in the last 70 years, it is time to really dive into two main questions. First off, how did America, being the most financially profitable country in the world, let its economy disintegrate in front of our own eyes? And secondly, what are regular American people doing now in order to protect themselves financially in result of the stock market crash? Let's let Ryan Gosling from The Big Short explain the basic problem to us. Hi, how are you? Hey, Mr. Bennett. Here we have. Let's see what you got. You smell that? What is that? What? What's that smell? The cologne? No. Opportunity. No, money. Oh, okay. I smell money. Okay. Chris. David. Sorry. This is your basic mortgage bond. All right? The originals were simple. They were just thousands of AAA mortgages bundled together, guaranteed by the U.S. government. The modern ones are different. They're private. And they're made up of layers of tranches. highest level triple A's getting paid first, the lowest rated B's getting paid last, taking on defaults first. Now obviously if you're buying B's, you can make more money, but they're a little risky. Sometimes they fail. Chris? Somewhere along the line, these B's and double B's went from a little risky to dog shit. Where's the trash? I'm behind you. I'm talking rock bottom FICO scores. No income verification. Adjustable rates, dog shit. The default rates are already up from one to 4%, fellas. And if they rise to 8%, and they will, a lot of these triple Bs are going to zero too. And that, you're too close, is an opportunity. Okay, you're saying that at 8% the bonds fail and we are already at 4%? That's right. If they go to eight, it's Armageddon. Yeah, that's right. How come nobody's talking about this? You're completely sure of the math. Look at him. That's my quant. Your what? My quantitative. My math specialist. Look at him. You notice anything different about him? Look at his face. That's pretty racist. Look at his eyes. I'll give you a hint. His name's Yang. He won a national math competition in China. He doesn't even speak English. Yeah, I'm sure of the math. Actually, my name's Jiang, and I do speak English. Jared likes to say I don't because he thinks it makes me seem more authentic. And I got second in that national math competition. Dating back to the 1970s, the housing market had been consistently known as the most stable sector of the American economy. In the years leading up to 2008, a couple of stockbrokers, such as Michael Burry, realized that the housing market was fraudulent. Michael Burry, a doctor from San Diego, realized that the United States government had been handing out mortgages without any prior evaluation and completely overvaluing the price of the houses that the mortgages were attached to. Throughout the 1970s and 80s, the housing market continued to boom because of the absurd rates in which the government w were granting people loans. Before people's eyes, banking became the biggest part of the American economy. Home loans and mortgages were being passed out like it was nothing. Now. Let's look at how investing into the housing market caused dysfunction in the overall economy. They bought investments called mortgage-backed securities. 
Mortgage backed securities are created when large financial institutions securitize mortgages. Basically, they buy up thousands of individual mortgages, bundle them together, and sell shares of that pool to investors. Investors gobbled these mortgage backed securities up. Again, they paid a higher rate of return than investors could get in other places, and they looked like really safe bets. For one, home prices were going up and up, so lenders thought, worst case scenario, the borrower defaults on the mortgage, we can just sell the house for more money. At the same time, credit ratings agencies were telling investors these mortgage-backed securities were safe investments. They gave a lot of these mortgage-backed securities AAA ratings, the best of the best. And back when mortgages were only for borrowers with good credit, mortgage debt was a good investment. Anyway, investors were desperate to buy more and more and more of these securities. So lenders did their best to help create more of them. But to create more of them, they needed more mortgages. So lenders loosened their standards and made loans to people with low income and poor credit. You'll hear these called subprime mortgages. Eventually, some institutions even started using what are called predatory lending practices to generate mortgages. They made loans without verifying income and offered absurd adjustable rate mortgages with payments people could afford at first, but quickly ballooned beyond their means. But these new subprime lending practices were brand new. That meant credit rating agencies could still point to historical data that indicated mortgage debt was a safe bet but it wasn't. These investments were becoming less and less safe all the time. But investors trusted the ratings and kept pouring in their money. Traders also started selling an even riskier product called collateralized debt obligations, or CDOs. And again, some of these investments were given the highest credit ratings from the ratings agencies, even though many of them were made up of these incredibly risky loans. As they just explained, the creation of the housing bubble was really started by the amount of money investors and the banks were putting into the housing market. And as we all know, a bubble will eventually burst. And that's exactly what it did. At the end of 2007, the adjustable rates that had been put on everybody's mortgages was going to kick in. This basically means that the price that people were paying for mortgage would skyrocket and they would not be able to pay for their mortgages anymore, causing for defaults all over the country. And in a few years, people are going to be doing what they always do when the economy tanks. They would be blaming immigrants and poor people. But Mark was wrong. In the years that followed, hundreds of bankers and rating agencies executives went to jail. The SEC was completely overhauled, and Congress had no choice but to break up the big banks and regulate the mortgage and derivatives industries. Just kidding. Banks took the money the American people gave them, and they used it to pay themselves huge bonuses and lobby the Congress to kill big reform. And then they blamed immigrants and poor people, and this time even teachers. And when all was said and done, only one single banker went to jail. This poor schmuck, Kareem Sarah Geldin from Credit Suisse. He hit a few billion in mortgage bond losses, something most of the big banks did on a good day during the crisis. Mark, can we sell now? I mean, the fund will make almost a billion dollars. You'll clear 200 mil, Mark. You know, once we sell, we'll be just like the rest of them. You know that. No, we're not. We're not the bad guys here. We didn't defraud the American people and prey on their dreams of owning a home. All right, they did. Now we get to kick them in the teeth. Billion dollars. That's right. But we got to close out our position or it could be zero. I mean, it, 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 it's now or never, Mark. Okay. Sell it all.
I think the biggest reason the stock market crashed is people didn't understand risk. People didn't understand why things had any value. Today, I think people think they think their way through it. They understand why things are valuable, whether they earn money, whether they are future projections, and they understand how to manage themselves a little bit better. As all of these highly leveraged speculative institutions blew up one after another, um, and the government had to step in to essentially save the whole financial system. Um, you know, what we have learned at Wintergreen is again to own, to own companies that have the ability to generate cash and lots of different currencies, that they have conservative balance sheets, they don't borrow a lot of money, they make products that people want, need, they desire, that you have management that's honest and focused, and that they're not concerned necessarily about their short-term bonus, but creating long-term wealth for everyone. And then the key lesson from 2008 is to stay focused, not to panic, and that when everyone else is in the throes of fear, the financial news networks are predicting the end of the world, that oftentimes you can find these wonderful gems just lying there, dollars at a big discount. And so what we did um, during that period of time is we kept upgrading what we did uh, we found a, we built a better and better portfolio, and that in turn allowed us to generate a very good return in 2009. And so, 2008, horrible year, life's gone on. Use these times of great stress as an opportunity, and those opportunities have the ability to make you wealthier. Very painful 2008, and I'm not sure exactly what we're doing differently, but we're trying to be involved in more diverse assets, more cash, more conservative investments, and more diverse investments, and we're willing to pull the trigger quickly. People looking at the experience they had in 2008 some people learned the dreadful wrong lesson. They got scared deeply and took action. And what happened to them is that they then not only sold at a low price, but they never came back into the market and they missed very strong response upward that came on after that. So for those who learned the wrong lesson, either because they put themselves at too much risk or they didn't understand the way markets behave or they didn't have the staying power whatever happened emotionally. They converted a short-term or medium-term loss into a permanent loss. And that's a dreadful reality. Those people will never get that money back again. You ask, did it change any long-term views, any fundamental beliefs? Honestly, no. Did I enjoy it? Absolutely not. Was I deeply upset? Yes. Did I have serious conversations with my wife? Yes. Did I wonder whether I was doing the right thing? Yes. Did I hang in there? Fortunately, yes. Horrible things do happen. That's what markets are all about. If you look back over time, every 30 or 40 years, horrible things come along and happen. And what does it take to get to a horrible thing? The absence of horrible things long enough for people to decide maybe this time it's different, maybe it's not gonna happen. And sure enough, shortly after everybody's feeling pretty good, it comes zooming through again because we do it ourselves. Howard Lindzen, the owner of the stockbroker company, StockTwits, said about the 2008 financial crisis, the biggest lesson of the crisis is that financial leverage is a tactic, not a strategy. Leverage makes you feel rich on paper, but it only takes a small correction to wipe you out. Trying to capture everything that was the financial crisis of 2008, clearly it was the, the housing bubble, the, everything captured in the big short. It was the stock market crash, not only in the United States, but all over the world, and it was the massive job losses in this country and all over the world leading to this huge recession. So it was a multiple series of things, job, companies failing, people losing their jobs, great loss of wealth through the stock market, and people losing values in their houses and losing their homes. That was the stock, that, that was the financial crisis. How did it end? It ended in people not knowing or trusting anything about what they did before and losing piles of money, their jobs, and their houses. 
What did they do about it? Well, we've been now it's been almost 10 years since then. In the 10 years since then, people have rebuilt and examined what went wrong. And so now they, they sort of think before they do. They say, does it make any sense? To, does this mortgage make sense? Does this stock make sense? Does this investment make sense? Does this business make sense? And I think people are just becoming much more analytical about any investment that they make. Are there excesses? Sure. Is, is Bitcoin a bubble? Probably. Is, is it... What's the value of Bitcoin? Nobody knows. Are stocks up too high? We're going to figure that out. But what's changed is people have become more analytical to try to deal with all the things that fell apart in that crisis.